Welcome to the Mental Margarita Show. All right. Nice. I like that name. <laughs> Might have it's to try one of those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? I'm telling you. So, Owner Platinum Garage, mm -hmm. Gina Glass, Preston Glass, Musical Royalty. This is like the royal family right here. Aww. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. Endless hits. Worked and wrote for Whitney Houston, Mays, Aretha Franklin, Cindy Lauper. Wow. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it's just phenomenal. It's you absolutely see, phenomenal. You know, Mace. Mace, you know, the rapper that uh, started with P. Diddy. That's that's who that is. Wow. That's unbelievable. So you guys feeling good today? Absolutely. Great. Weather's beautiful <laughs> here in L.A. Oh, guys, I love L.A. Love it. Love it so much. So tell me about it now. So let's 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 go back. We'll start with you, Gina. Mm -hmm. How was how was your start getting into the music business? Because, you know, I've read that you've you know, you, you hung around Sly and the Family Stone and Larry Graham. You had those those kind of guys around you, all that energy. So how did it start for you? Well, when I was nine years old, my sister uh, started working around with Graham Central Station. And even before that, my family had been around the music industry and just so happened that her and Larry Graham hooked up and got married. So that was my first taste of being a kid in the recording studio and Sausalito at the record plan and, you know, going to all the gigs and all of that at a very young age in Oakland, California. And then I met my honey at the record plant in San Francisco, I mean, in Sausalito, uh, where we met and we got married three weeks after we met. And then I became his business manager. Wow. Is that something else? Yeah. yeah so Love at first sight. Love at first sight. And, and so, Preston, here you are doing your thing. Tell me a little about, a bit about you. So you were starting out, was the music something that was always in your blood or what? Uh, yeah, it was a gift. Uh, I started writing songs when I was about five or six years old and uh, playing guitar. Then I learned how to read music and I started playing keyboards. And uh, right, right around the age of uh, 12, I started uh, sending my music out to different publishers and stuff. I knew early on that I wanted to be a songwriter, producer, mainly a songwriter. I didn't really have the desire to be a singer or artist because I always would look at the records. You know, you know what those are? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, believe me. I know what they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I would look at it and I'd see, of course, you had the main artist's name right there, but then there would be some names in parentheses and that would be the songwriter. And I remember uh, asking my dad, who are those people mentioned in the parentheses? He said, that's the songwriter. And they make they make the money. <laughs> that is so true. They definitely do make the money. And so speaking of money, I mean, you were on the money because as time progresses, I mean, you've done some hits or, or should I say you've done many hits. We got 30 top 10 R&B hits. Has that number gone up? Yeah, it's gone up a little bit more. And the industry's changed because now, Back then, it was only Billboard or Cashbox. Yeah. Charts. Now you got hundreds of different charts mm -hmm. and all over the world. So I've had stuff that was like number one on maybe the UK chart, but didn't even enter the mm -hmm. Billboard chart because it's just the way the industry is now. But to answer that question, yeah, uh, by those standards, yeah, there's been, you know, many wow. dozen. Hits, but, uh, that's something else that's something else five top 10 pop hits yeah you know one thing that i love about you is that you you're, you're very versatile thank you i as think as far as the artists you worked with that happened uh i think naturally or organically like people say 
because uh, I personally like all different kinds of music. I think I got that from uh, my upbringing as a, uh, what they call an army brat. Uh, my dad was in the army for 20 years. Okay. So uh, wherever he would be, that would be the music I would latch on to. You know, sometimes we live in an area where you only hear pop music. Or sometimes I live in an area and it's all soul music. Sometimes it'd be an area of all country music. And so whatever's on the rip was on the radio. You know what that is? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's got all different mechanisms now. But uh, so I attribute my love of different kinds of music to my upbringing. You know, that's real interesting because I can I can relate. Um you know, me growing up, I, I went to a private school, you know, and even though I lived in a very bad area at one point, you know, in my life, but I went to a private school. So I was around kids of different ethnicities, you know, and so one minute I'm listening to it could be Bon Jovi. You know, the next minute I was listening to Billy Joel and Huey Lewis in the news. Hey, then it was hey. Frankie Beverly at Maze. It was. Yeah, I think that we it not only uh, helped me with the love of different kind of music, but, you know, you're as, as a producer, especially, you're working in the studio with all different kinds of musicians and different kinds of people, different nationalities, different backgrounds, young, old, white, black, you know. And if you're the producer, you're in charge of those sessions, so you have to be able to communicate to, to anybody. Right. That's so true. That's and, and speaking of communicating, so so Gina, yeah. you had to be a great communicator as well because now this is your your this is your new love. This is your husband now, and and you you guys are going through this 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 crazy business. Mm -hmm. now, what were some of the things that you had to do from the management side to keep it all together, to keep the communication between you guys the way that you guys wanted to? you know, wanted it to be, for it to be solidified and strong? Well, first of all, they don't want to piss the wife off the manager <laughs> because then therefore they're not going to work with them. You know, so what I do is I negotiate his contracts. I'm very fair. Uh, I normally don't come out of myself with people, um, you know, and it makes it pretty easy because we're a team and we work together. And sometimes if he feels it's something that he wants to do that I feel that maybe isn't good for him and he wants to do it, he's the head of the household. So I go, I say, go ahead, you can have it. You know, so <laughs> we keep a balance that way and never just letting the business drive us crazy, but right. better love of each other. And, and I respect, you know, what he has to say and what he wants to do because he, he's the music man. I'm just... Uh, the wife on the side that knows the business and the publishing side of it as well as him. And he, he's basically taught me everything I knew about the business because I came in very raw. I had just been around the industry and, you know, concerts and having fun and all that type of thing. But um, when he said, look, I need you to be my manager. You're the only one I can trust. I was really against it a little bit. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm loving just throwing the dinner parties and, you know, and, and keeping the house clean and being the wife. And he goes, no, <laughs> you got to do more. So I finally stopped fighting him. I said, okay, just teach me everything, you know, and we'll, we'll go and through there, it there together. Was, there was a good uh, observation of, of me with her, not just because she was my wife, but, and of course the trust issue, but I noticed she has, good in instincts about things, you know, when right. she's dealing with people, especially. But uh, so that has played out in, you know, over 30, 30, going on 39 years of marriage. And then she's managed me for about 37. And wow. So, uh, I think I was correct in assuming, okay, she's, she knows how to deal with people. And that's really what the music business okay. is, is especially on a longevity business. No, no matter how, the industry changed as much as it is, you still have to deal with people. And if you're going to right. be around a long time, you have to know how to do that. Yeah, that's that's really important. And now, so Gina, you, you've been on plenty of industry panels and consulting boards and things of that nature. What are, what are some of the things that for a young viewer, someone that's getting into the industry, 
What are some of the things that they need to focus on? Well, I tell them, first of all, um, learn the business. You know, your craft is fine or have somebody that's really in your corner, your parents or whatever, you know, to have your back and listen to them and and really learn what the music industry is about instead of just your songwriting or your your singing and getting out there and being on tour because all of that has a whole lot of little little bitty pieces in between it that if you don't learn some of that stuff you could get taken advantage of really 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 fast wow um we we've, we've been through things in the industry where we've learned and we've made some you know, pitfalls, but it, you know, it helped us to never make that mistake again, but it's all about learning. And then Preston taught at San Francisco State and UCLA songwriting in the music business. Right. That's right. Which was a four hour class. It was so wonderful because he would have different artists come in and speak like Maurice White and uh, who Al, else? Jarreau. Al Jarreau. Who else? Oh, maybe? And Legends. Right. Stevie Wonder's wife. Um, Oh, a lot of different people. Leon Ware, a great late great Leon Ware. Yes. And yourself. Well, and I that was by default. Okay. When somebody <laughs> wouldn't show up, you'd be like, baby. And I'd be like, really? <laughs> I have to speak in front of all these, you know, kids and 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 I'd get so nervous and I'd be like, okay, okay, let me just pray for a minute. <laughs> and then at times we I had a couple of students that were because it was an extension course, so not just young people, any anybody could take mm -hmm. the class. And I, so a couple of times I've had number one recording artist be the student. And I wow. recognize their name on the list. I'd say, oh, you're a so-and-so from so-and-so group. And they'd be, yeah, the reason I took this class, even though I had a number one hit, I didn't write the song. And so I didn't make much money. So I'm here to learn how to write something. Wow, is that something? Yeah. Because publishing is where it's at, guys. Oh, well, yeah. 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 And, and most artists don't write their songs. I mean, they're starting to do it now. Yeah. But uh, they didn't write their songs. So what the way they made money was definitely going on tour. That that was their po that was their money pocket, you know. And then they had to be careful about how many people they took out and what they had on the tour because then you'll owe all that, you know, you owe all that money back and then you come back and you got these hits out here, but you're broke. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a sad thing to be famous and broke. Yeah. And it happens more than you think. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not a good combination at all. Exactly. Now, when you look at songwriting, is there, ever, is there any time Preston where you're, like you, 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 you've gotten writer's block, and 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 how did you deal with that? No, I've never gotten no. writer's block uh, myself. I know it's a gift, but uh, whoa! With me, it's because I think it's because early on it was like a discipline. Like there was a time, maybe age nine, 10, 11, I would write a song a day. So it was like homework at school. You know, if I didn't do it. Right. I, I would punish myself like you know <laughs> I gotta write a song a day. I don't do that anymore, but um but he writes multiple songs a day. I mean this dude is always like before we had the cell phones, it would be pieces of paper, napkin, um all the answering machine, you know, you couldn't have cell phones so you had to find a way to record your Well the way he wrote the song, you, know, you don't have to take your clothes off for Jane Jermaine Stewart, it was four o'clock in the morning and we had a walk-in closet he had a little keyboard in there and he woke me up and I'm like why are you waking me up he said I got this idea for Jermaine it's gonna call you don't have to get naked I said oh no you got to change that that, that I said you you have a clean <laughs> you know, thing going here with with, with the people so you got to change that lyric up I said it and then he came back with you don't have to take your clothes off I said boom that's bad baby that's the hit that's it now. <laughs> and so he wrote it in the closet at four o'clock in the morning. So when his brain gets to moving and he's always got a piece of paper and pen by his bed or wherever he sits in the living room, you know, but now with the phone, so he's got that. And so. I always can't, I can't turn it off. Oh, you know, like never. you said something earlier yourself. You know, the guy, Kat, you said, uh, famous and broke. That's not a good combination. I said, hmm, famous. See, he go write a song like, about it. Like, wait, hold on. 
<laughs> you, you know I'm a hip hop artist. Look, we, oh yes, we, yeah, I, I could sense that. We yeah. might have to do a collaboration. <laughs> there we go. That is so cool. So now let's look. Public. Okay, so the publishing house is still permanent group music. Yeah, we have a few different ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the and the, all our publishing companies have the initial PG, so permanent groove, which is my my initial is personal. permanent groove, right. Our main company is Platinum Garage, and that's also the name of our record company, Platinum Garage Recordings. I love that. I love that name. Love it. Smaller company called Perpetual Gold. So a lot of these people might say, why do you have all these? Well, sometimes we'll start one and then sell it off. Or sometimes if we keep it, uh, like, for instance, I am a BMI writer. You can't be a BMI and ASCAP writer, mm -hmm. but you can be a BMI and ASCAP publisher. So BMI publishing is Platinum Garage, and then she owns the ASCAP company, Permanent Group. Ah. So if there, and the reason why we have both is because sometimes we'll meet a writer mm -hmm. that we really yeah, think yeah. is great, and we want to take them on as a protege, but they're an ASCAP writer, so we can have them come under that company. That is that is really, really smart. Mm -hmm. and, and and for the viewers, this is something that you guys got to, you know, you got to listen to because this is golden. This stuff that they're saying is golden. Now, what's the overall vision for Platinum Garage? What is the overall vision? You want to Okay. Well, <clears throat> Platinum Mirage, uh, as a record company, because it is a company that we have uh, that is uh, co-run by my uh, music business partner, David Nathan, out of England, who's known as the British Ambassador of Soul. We've had a, a label that is distributed through Warner X, part of the Warner Music Group. And we've had it for almost six years now. And in these six years, we've released product every six weeks. And so now we're coming upon our 50th release. Uh, wow. Yeah, six six weeks every, you know, for, for six years it comes to. So the 50th release will actually be an album of uh, I'm the Artist. Uh, it's called uh, Preston Glass and Chosen Family. So I because I have a lot of support with these great vocalists. Uh, so it'll be a, a 12 song album that'll probably be out November 17th. And that'll be our 50th release. So uh, we keep busy. Wow, you guys really keep busy. I love it. But to answer your question, you asked, uh, what's the vision or what's the... Yeah, what's the overall vision of it? Well, we want to uh, do music that is true to ourselves we're not trying to follow any trend right we know soul music my uh partner's company is called soul music records so anything we do is a kind of a flavor of soul whether it's jazzy soul or like we just did a, a single that came out last week with uh the lead singer of mm -hmm. the stylistics so. uh the, the original lead singer who sang all them hits russell tonkins jr and he, we stay true to his sound. You know, he has a specific sound, a specific sound of music. And um, it's getting really good response because we're not trying to follow, oh, today's 2023. 20, oh, please, please don't. Please don't. Well, and that come from the Tom Bell era where, you know, he produced all the stylistics things and Preston was a pro protege of Tom Bell. That was the first guy that took him in when he was, what, 18 years old and signed him as a writer. And so that was his first start. So he's got that Tom Bell influence and a lot of his music. And Russell just happens to be a dear friend of ours. And so we've got more to come on him, but that the first single has just been released here. I think he'll be here in a couple of weeks. And we'll- Wow, and the first single is Ready For Anything. Yeah, you did yes. your homework. <laughs> hey, you ready for anything? I'm ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I just spoke recently to uh, Jerry Bell. Oh, oh wow. yeah. Yeah, I just spoke to him recently. So that's that's kind of interesting 
how you guys are bringing them up. Now, what is the process for you? What is the process for you when you're when you're doing songwriting? Is there any particular process? Well, I'd say yes, and then I like to leave it open to it's not always a hundred percent the same way, but I'd say ninety five percent I'll start with the song title, you know, uh, because that will spark me. Like if I have a title, well, Gina mentioned that song, We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off. So when I had that title, I was like, okay, well, basically saying we don't have to take our clothes off to have a good time. We we can dance and party and drink some cherry wine. You know, so in other words, that was at a time when um, safe sex and all that was prominent mm-hmm. back in the 80s. And so um, then, so I knew what the lyric was going to be about just by the title. And then sometimes the title will also spark the music, like with a title like that, I said, no, nah, it ain't going to be a ballad because you're talking about dancing and party. So it's probably right. tempo. Ironically, though, <laughs> I think it was about 20 years later after the song was released, uh, a lady out of England released it as a ballad and it was a huge hit. Uh, so a good song can be done many different styles. Many different ways. Yeah. That's interesting. So I'm telling you, whatever process that you, you you have, depending on what song that you write, it's 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 unbelievable because it seems to me that it, it works. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I think we can all agree with that. Yes, yeah. I agree with that one. Yeah, now kind of helps me. In uh, you asked the question earlier, do I get writer's block? And I hate to sound formatic, but formalistic but uh because i've kind of follow that thing well if i feel like i'm a little stuck i just go to my i have a list of about seven thousand song titles because uh-huh. i just jot them down and go go through them and i'll just pick some boom or i might be doing a project where oh so and so needs a, a duet or whatever so i look on the list for a title that fits a duet then I, once I have the title, that sparks the vibe of the music. So I'll sit at the piano and start coming up with a melody. And then I'll write the lyrics to the to the title and the melody. And then after that, I put on a different hat. Oh, there's my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, it's a little shiny. But um, then I'll go put on a different hat, and that's when the production and the arrangement comes in. Sometimes, especially these days, a lot of producers and artists they'll get a track and then they'll write to the track. Nothing right. Wrong with that. But then a lot of times if you want to change the arrangement or the the vibe of the music is it's, it's kind of too late. But what I do it the old fashioned way where the song is there, then you can arrange it any way you want. Put, way you want. Yeah. So yeah. It's like painting, like the song is pencil and paper. And then production and arrangement is more of the different colors you can put on the song. Oh man, that's 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 beautiful, man. That's beautiful because I I love to write me personally, and my process is, is a lot similar. You oh. know, I I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm I'm stuck that I go one way. You know what I mean? Right. I want to yeah. be able want to be a band and and. And and sometimes not follow the rules, you know. A lot of times, yeah, that's great. That's always good when you can do something a little different, because then you get people, to, you know, go, "Whoa, what is that?" That's what you want to do. Is kind of you want to have a style, but then you want to step outside a little bit because there's so many people. See, back in the day when I came up, you couldn't just release your own song. You had to get a rec- radio to play it, a record deal, and then. You know, or get a, if you're a songwriter, get a, get an artist to do it, um, and then it came back to the record deal thing. So there were doors you had to open. Now you can put out your own music. So what that's done though is kind of there's a lot of people out there that are not that good. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they can afford the equipment. You know, back in the day, you had to spend a quarter of a million dollars to get a recording mm-hmm. studio equipment. Now, right, right. and you know, four or five thousand dollars you got yourself a recording studio and then you may not have the talent, but you have, you can go to CD Baby or TuneCore or one of these places yeah. and it goes all over the world. 
And what that cause, what ha that has caused is a lot of mediocre music gets out, kind of gluts the marketplace. Yeah. So you really have to find a way to stand out to get through it's, all that, that mess, you know? I so a lot of underground stuff, you know, back in the day, um, the cream always rose to the top, you know, top of the charts or top of the uh, live performance or television. Now, there's so many platforms and so much music out there. You know, it's hard. I have a lot of friends that say, oh, music is terrible these days. Mm -hmm. That's not true. There's a lot of great music out there, but you got to dig to find it. Yeah, you got a mind for it. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. You definitely do. Now, I want to ask you guys this. What is your take on AI? <laughs> well, you're, you're talking to two AI nuns. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It's too good to be true. I knew it. Your head can't be that clean, man. No. Uh, I, I think it's crazy, but then at the same time, I think it's uh, a sign of where we are in history, I mean, you, there's so much that can be created. Yeah. Uh, hey, welcome to <laughs> who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, you know. I know the other day <laughs> we were driving somewhere, I saw a robot delivering food and I'm like, man. Man, I'm telling you, it's it's, it's a oh, different one. Yeah. Walking right by it like it's normal. Right. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know what? I love I love you guys. And I thank you guys so much for being on this show. I mean, this is an absolute honor. And we're coming to Vegas soon. So uh, we would love to meet up with you. My daughter just moved there. So I'm going to be, we'll be coming a lot more. We got to do it, guys. We got to do it. Are you we'll, get, we'll get a nice bite and maybe we'll go somewhere and hear some, some really good music, you know? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll leave it to you to show us where to go. Absolutely. And where's the little furry guy? Is the furry the little... he he Look. he decided to get down. Yeah. He's he's our he's a music guy too. Whenever he's uh we leave the house, he has he, music on that he, he listens did. to he 24 7. Oh, that's cute. Now I want to ask you guys one more thing before we go. Sure. Uh, how for any new releases, any new projects that you got. Where do the viewers go? Well, for uh, social media, you you know, just look up Preston Glass. Uh, there's also Preston Glass Music fan page. And uh, that's for uh, Facebook. For um, Instagram, it's me. I'm a P Glass 1012. You always know, so I have a hat on. So <laughs> another Preston, it ain't, it ain't me. Gina's got her. Handle. What's your handle? Uh, Gina McKinney Glass. Um, right. On both social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All right. Well, there you have it. Preston and Gina Glass. This is music royalty, guys. Yeah. On the Margarita Show. Love you guys. Be safe. See you in Vegas really soon. Let's huh. stay in. Oh, and, and, and guess what? We yeah. also... Give a shout out to Rhea Roma because yeah. Rhea is the one that connect me with you guys. And oh my goodness, thank you so much, Rhea, as well. Yeah, okay. that's my girl. We yeah. go way back with the Pointer Sisters. Former member of the Dad Band is and, in the house. And New Birth. And New Birth. Yeah. From a musical royal family of bells. <laughs> he's performed and recorded side by side with the greatest. From Marvin Gaye to Michael Jackson, the list goes on and on. Yeah. I proudly introduce to you. Mr. Jerry Bell is in the building.
peace and love, <laughs> and all that good stuff, you know? All that good stuff, man. How you feeling? I'm good, man. I, you know, I look, I'm alive today. I can't complain too much. Living good and, you know, just trying to stay out of everybody's way. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, we got to, we got to stay out of everybody's way. Yeah. I mean, so much things going on. Now, born in Philly, your yes, mom sang in the church. Your, fa your father was cut from the military disciplinarian cloth. Yes, okay. sir. Soul music in your family dream, uh, in your family genes. Your dreams actually turn into reality. But how was that like for you growing up? Um, It was good, man. I really didn't have no choice. You know, my father was a disciplinarian type of guy. You know, he was a career Marine. Um, my brothers, you know, they were all singers. Archie was, you know, one of the, the main ones in the group, in the, uh, in the whole, in the household. And then, um, we had, uh, my cousins, Tom Bell, who was with Philly International, you know, he did all the arranging and writing for Gamblin' Huff, for the Whispers, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Whispers, for the Delphonics, uh, the Stylistics, um, for uh Harold Melvin the Blue Notes, Blue Magic, Major Harris, you wow. know, those groups like that, the spinners. So um it was good. And then also uh, my cousin, uh my other cousin Cool from uh, Robert Cool Bell from Cool in the Gang. And then another uh cousin who uh actually started Stax Records was Al Bell. Wow. And the list goes on, man. There's other cousins in the music industry too that's you know, I wow. haven't even named. Uh, and I had a brother, uh, a younger brother who's no longer with us, who was uh, who was a sports uh, person. He was uh, a Heisman Trophy winner and uh, played. He was a running back, played for Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and went to uh, went to uh, USC. Was Ricky Bell? Ricky Bell, that's right, yeah. man. I'm yeah. telling you, what a blessed family, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Unbelievable. Yeah, now, so. so you you got vocal training from your mother. You were, I mean, you also were taking on <laughs> tours with the Miami Ocean Liners, yeah. better known as Casey and the Sunshine. And the Sunshine Band. And that was before Casey got with them. The band itself, by itself, uh, I was actually introduced uh, to that to that band by a uh, singer out of uh, out of Florida, by the name of Jimmy Bohorn. And uh, Jimmy Bohorn, he had a record called uh, Dance Across the Floor, Clean Up Man, which was the follow-up record to Clean Up Woman to Betty Wright. Um, I... So, yeah, you know, I, I came out of that out of that staple. And um, the Miami Ocean Liners was a band that backed everybody. Uh, and I just happened to be one of the, the just the lead singer of, the, of, the, uh, of that group. And then after I left that group, KC came in. And then, you know, wrote uh, Woman, was it Rocky Baby for George McCray? That's and right. then history after that for him, you know. But yeah, and I had left the uh, Ocean Liners to join New Birth. And you joined yeah. New Birth. Wow, that's, that's something else. How was your experience with New Birth? Listen, man, that band was the greatest band on the planet. We were, we were truly underrated. Uh, we had a lot of big hit records uh, from I Can Understand It to Wildflower to Been Such a Long Time to Mr. Dream Merchant, uh, Got to Get a Night. And we had a lot of hits. Um, we were kicking everybody's ass from Earth, Wind & Fire. <laughs> when, and I just had that I just had that conversation with Ralph Johnson uh, from Earth, Wind & Fire, too. He was telling me about how Maurice was very upset and made them work twice as hard now. You know, <laughs> she wasn't taking that beating anymore. But we started out as an opening act for wow. uh, everybody, and then because we were we were be just beating up people so badly with our concert, with our shows, um, they uh, they decided the promoters decided to make us headliners, and so we started headlining shows, and and just um, the group broke up in 1979, which was heartbreaking for me. But um, unfortunately, you know how things go when you're in a group of 13, 14 people, um, or even seven or eight people, um, you have the uh, the egotistical problems that you're dealing yeah. with. You know, some people in the band might have drug problems, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, that's, that's what we were facing, unfortunately, you know. 
And yeah. you've always you've always kept a a clean uh, bill of health. I ha well, first of all, I had no I had no um I had no option but to do that because my family would not deal with anything else. Especially my father was totally different. He didn't care how old you were either. You know, you get right. smacked down. <laughs> <laughs> you still get it. You know, he he take you on the Marine Corps base, brother, and uh, and bring in one of them rooms and bring the drill sergeants in there, and you got a problem. <laughs> oh, uh, but no, man, I I um I truly believed, and uh, I've never in my life um had any kind of vaccines, inoculations. Um, I've never taken over the counter drugs. I never smoked, never drank. You know, so my thing has always been. Um, I believe in my health. I eat properly, you know, vegan. So that kind of thing, man. Nice. Stay on top of my game, man. You got to because look at the kind of world we live in or the kind of country we live in. You know what I mean? You got to stay on top of your game 24-7, man. They're going to wipe you out, you know. I'm so, telling you. And yeah. speaking, speaking of game, you, you learned a lot of game from a very special friendship that you had with the late, great Marvin Gaye. How yeah. instrumental was that for you becoming the bona fide artist that you are? Um, Marvin, uh, how I met Marvin, I, I dated Marvin's uh, sister, Ziola, they call her Sweetie. And we dated for some years, and that's how I ended up meeting Marvin. And um, sitting in the studio and watching, uh, watching Marv, uh, you know, how he recorded and vocally you know sitting with him and and at, at the house and watching him write songs i watched him watch him write trouble man um for uh, uh yeah for, and then uh and then just other things that he was working on with uh curtis mayfield uh when curtis was doing superfly and you oh. know and uh uh there was a group called the originals uh they had a they had a record called uh, The Bells. I'll never hear the bells when you leave me. I'll never. Da -da -da. That was Marvin Gaye's song. He wrote that. Wrote that he song. wrote it? Yeah. And wow. um, a lot of, lot of other, lot of other uh, uh, groups that Marvin was writing for, a lot of people didn't, you know, didn't know. He wrote a lot of good music. So, you know, Marvin was one. James Brown was the other. Um, I had a chance to uh, to meet James and and to go out on tour. When we were at uh, with New Birth, we toured with James for a minute, and then he kicked wow. us off the show <laughs> because he said this was the James Brown show, not the New Birth show. So he didn't <laughs> like being being staged, you know, outstaged, uh, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, man, I just I, I've had the opportunity to to work with a lot of wonderful people. The Daz Band experience. Uh, that was another, um, you know, another great band, uh, another another outstanding situation to be in, to be invited in. Um, Philip Bailey and Ralph Johnson from Earth, Wind and Fire um, brought me over to the to the guys, and uh, they needed another lead singer. the uh, The other original lead singer was Skip Martin, and so uh, and Kenny. Well, actually, the original original his name was Kenny Pettis. And that's when they were called the Kinsman Dads, man. Right. And so um, a lot of people don't want to tell the truth, you know. So, <laughs> so it takes me to have to do that, you know. I'm glad you're but, doing uh, it. We had, uh, the group was was outstanding. It went very well for many years. And then, of course, you know, within that group as well, you know, we, we went into the uh, dealing with the egotistical problems, the battling of, you know, leadership was oh, out of whack um i won't call any names but um you know <laughs> the leadership was fucked up <laughs> and um and you know it was it was that kind of thing man and uh and so the the, the dad's band eventually started dying off and then one of our members committed suicide um oh. the bass player killed himself based on the same thing membership problems you know with the membership with the leadership uh in the band and then we had a we had another uh man beautiful brother um his name was terry stanton they used to call him pretty terry before mm -hmm. he got with dad's band he sang with a group called the polyester players mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> terry was murdered um viciously he was murdered because of a mistaken identity um of the leader uh in the band at the time the leader um 
the, the guy that killed him thought that he was the leader of the band because the leader of the band owed money to this individual. And so Terry was murdered and, you know, just band started going downhill. So I said, look, I got into a lawsuit actually with uh, the band uh, and David Geffen, Geffen Records, uh, for copyright infringements. And um, it, the battle was just crazy, man. And then constantly okay. battling over the trademark on the name and everything. So I'd say, you know what? I was Jerry Bell before I was the Daz Band. And yes. before the Daz Band knew about me, you know, I came out of a, a group that was just a dynamite group, which was New Birth. So let me go back to me. And so that's what I'm doing now. I'm uh, I'm actually a solo artist, uh, signed to Bungalow Records, Bungalow Universal. Got a single out right now uh, called Keep It Real, which you can- that's Keep It Real, that's damn, yeah, man. Yeah, man. You can go on, uh, on YouTube and pull it up, uh, Spotify. You, yeah, man. Yeah, so that's a hit record, man. It's actually- um, it's doing well. I, I didn't. I didn't know it was going to do as well over in uh, overseas as it is, like in China, um, Vietnam, and Thailand. I'm like shocked, man. It's good. I, I didn't know I had that many fans. I was in. Uh, I was in China um, right before the fake dimic, um, <laughs> and uh, I was over there in, in 2018, 2019, and 20, uh, 2020, around the beginning of 2020. And um, uh, we were, I mean, we, we killed over there, man. It was, uh, we did, I did 78,000 in Beijing and 92,000 in um, in uh, Shanghai. And I, I had no clue I had a, span, a fan base like like that huge over there, you know. So and you, was, you've been connected, you've been connected to that, that whole culture, you know, um, one of the things I want to say is you spent a lot of time in Japan and other countries, yeah. you know, like what, what is it about their culture that identifies with you that connects you in that kind of way? Well, um, as you, uh, read my, my, I guess, as you look at my bio, my biography and, and, you know, you go to my website and see the things that I've done. One of the, one of the other things that kept me grounded was I did martial arts for a very very long time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I studied uh, I studied Japanese karate in Japan, um, and under some of the greatest Japanese masters. Um, I lived in Japan, Okinawa, um, and then uh, I opened up a dojo in uh, in Osaka in Japan, so which is still running right now. And then I trained uh, in Malaysia um, with some of the Malaysian Sufi masters. And in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, studying uh, Chinese wushu and um, uh, just you know a lot of different people, man. Actually, some of my friends was Jackie Chan and uh, and Jet Li. I, I had an opportunity to work with uh, with Jet um, on uh, Cradle to the Grave. I doubled DMX in that film. Oh, uh, you and, did? Uh, yeah, man. And then uh, worked with Eddie on the choreography for uh, Undercover Brother, uh, one and two. Wow, so, that's something you know you say something that i was i was reading you say the moment of the brush the movement of the brush and calligraphy are the same movements of kata and karate mm -hmm. and i mean just explain that to me that that quote because that quote was very deep so as you see as well i'm an artist as well an art artist artist i draw and i and i paint i do uh you know i do japanese calligraphy japanese and chinese calligraphy and um the stroke of the brush is the same as the striking with the hand because you can you can uh say you do a, a, a stroke like this so then you strike with the hand or you punch with the hand or the kick and then um, in the chinese style which is the wing chung or the wushu everything is is moves like so, you know, with grace and form. So then your brush stroke is basically the same thing. It's according to what you're uh, what you're writing, uh, right. and then the end of the of the stroke is very important. And it's the same as when you're holding the sword, uh, the katana. It's the same way when you're striking with the sword. You know, it's the same effect. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's phenomenal. It's very harmonized, you know.
It, it, it really is. And, and harmonizing, you know, in your life it's been because the art and the martial arts have played a very major role shaping who you are today. Would you agree? Absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, that as well as just, you know, meeting beautiful people, man, in my life, I've had the, I really had the opportunity of, of spending some, some time and learning from others. You know, I spent time with Michael Jackson on the bad tour. So you know, <laughs> that was, that was really phenomenal, man. And then Michael was, was best friend. We were very, very close friends. Uh, Mike was close friends with me and, and Eddie Griffin. So, um, and then being around Ed, man, you know, even though Eddie's, uh, he's a 24 hour a day com comic, comic, uh, comedian walking, you know, I can uh, imagine. he don't, he don't, huh? he don't <laughs> give you a break. Hey, listen, man, look, if you hanging with Eddie Griffin, prepare, <laughs> prepare to get picked on. <laughs> he ain't gonna give you no break, man. You know, but Eddie's, uh, Eddie's soul is just incredible. <clears throat> Let me give you a quick story, man. Um, I I got into a a situation uh, here, a problem with LAPD back in nineteen uh, um, eighty nine, and I ended up becoming a fugitive on the run. So I, you know, as they as as the government or uh, this system, you know, the way that they have most of our people trained, you know, when you get into some kind of trouble, you either run home to your mama's house or you go to your girlfriend's house or you go back on the block where you were brought up and you're hanging out and then they end up catching you, right? right. So I ended up um, leaving the country and I ended up in Malaysia. And um, just so happened that um, the, the gentleman that got me on the, on the plane to Malaysia was friends with the king of Malaysia's uh, son. Uh -huh. And so they said, well, you get him here and we will we'll give him sanction because there's no extraditional treaty in our country. And so I ended up over there and they took care of me. And then I ended up meeting the Sultan of Brunei, which is the one of the richest men in the world. And we became very good friends and, you know, everything was, beautiful and working out and long story short I ended up getting kidnapped by um the U.S. Marshals wow. they came they tried they tried to extract me uh actually twice uh from over there which was in um 19 uh 1991 and um 1990 and 1991 they tried to extract me and they couldn't uh, because they wouldn't, they wouldn't let them take me. Because again, there was no extraditional treaty. Wow. So the only way that they can get anybody from overseas is to come up with uh, unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And so they send uh, U.S. Oh, bounty hunters to get yeah. you right. So uh, they came in the country in 1992 when there was this major summit, Asian summit going on, and the Sultan of Brunei and the King of Malaysia was out of the out of the country at the time. And so they were able to get in and uh, con the local police to turn me over. Wow. And so they extracted me and um, brought me back here. And long story short, I had a, a judge trial. Uh, Johnny Cochran was my lawyer. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. So that's why I'm sitting here today talking to you. <laughs> so Johnny Cochran was my lawyer. He represented me and... Uh, and he represented me on the on the basis of um, a friend, another friend, which actually was one of my karate students, <clears throat> who um, who told Johnny to to uh, uh, to assist me, <clears throat> and that was Cuba Gooding Jr. Wow. Uh, Cuba, Cuba Jr. Um, he helped me in in quite a few ways, and so once I once I got out of uh, out of lockdown because they were trying to give me the death penalty for this particular crime okay. that, or what they call a crime, but it was in self-defense. And um, uh, Gil Garcetti was the prosecuting attorney, same one that that prosecuted uh, O.J. Simpson. So um, yeah, Johnny represented me. I uh, beat the case by technicality. And then um, I, was, I, I, was, I was pretty down at that time too. I had no capital, no... Um, just I was just down on my luck, 
you know. Yeah. And then to the rescue, two people came to my aid, man. And I, I can never forget them for that. Um, and I don't normally tell, this is the first time I told this story out in public, period, you know. Wow. Um, and I'm only telling you partial partial parts of it. You know, I haven't even told, got in depth of what really went down. But two people came to my aid. One was Eddie Griffin. Wow. And the other one was Sinbad. Wow. And uh, they helped me out financially to get back on my feet. And that's that's, that's a Jerry Brown story, man. <laughs> man, that is awful, brother. Yeah, man. Those guys, I um, mean, beautiful souls, man, you know. And uh, along with Cuba, even even though Cuba has his, his problems that he goes through up and down, you know, which we all do as a black man in this country, you know, um, anything could happen, man. At any given time, you uh, never know. You never know when the tables are going to turn and who you're going to need, you know. And right now, with the with the way that things are going, we really need each other, you know, because we don't have nobody else. And if you look at everything that's going on with this country, this European demonic devil, he's bringing in, as he did before, his own people. He, now he's bringing over the, the Ukrainians to try to save his uh, his his birth growth because it's it's at zero population right now, yeah. you know. And with all the homosexual stuff going on and the lesbianism going on, you know, there's no birth growth in their communities. You know, and so uh, in order to stop the brown, the black and the and the, uh, you know, the the indigenous man in this country is to right. bring in, try to bring in their people and then bring people from overseas because they know that in a minute this whole country is going to shut down. And even white people are going to say, hey, we ain't doing this no more. So the right. only ones that are be able to depend on to do the workforce are the in, the uh, the immigrants that, are, that they're bringing into this into this country. You know, so we need each other, man, like like yesterday, you know yeah. what I mean? We And we really need to stop the bullshit, you know, and um, and we need to step up to the plate and handle our business with one another. You know, that's yeah. definite, man. Put all the bullshit aside, all the hate, all the anger, whatever. And we need to come together as a united people, man, and uh, and take care of our business. If not, th this country's going to sink. Well, it's going to sink without us anyway. Right, but it's going to sink if uh, if the whole country doesn't come together, man, and uh, and get their shit together, you know, get their head out their ass and cut out the bullshit, you know, uh, all the way down with them southern boys down in the, in uh, in southern white boys down in the, uh, Virginia and Alabama and all that foolishness they still doing, you know, with right. the lynching and the and the hate and all that kind of stuff, man. I don't know why they would hate us. We ain't got nothing to do with what this government. And what the powers that be from the the J. Paul Gettys, the Rockefellers, the McLeroy's, you know, um, even down right. to the Bill Gates and all these different people in the in the in the Vatican and all of these people like that doing all this bullshit on this planet, man, to everybody, you know, um, we don't have no we have no control over the guns that they bring in from the Israel, you know, the the AK forty seven rifles and shit. I'm you know I'm down. I don't I don't care. I fear nothing. You know right. what I mean? Exactly. Um, uh, the 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 drugs that they bring in from over in in different countries, you know, um, the um, we don't make the poppy fields, you know, that they were fighting over in Vietnam and that kind of shit, and and then uh, we definitely don't make um, all these um, uh, these new these new diseases that they're coming up with, you know, right. and and people should really look back and look at, you know, the the Tuskegee experiment. If if our people ain't learned by now, not to take not to take anything from these so called doctors and believe they bullshit, then you deserve to die. <laughs> yeah, that's just bottom line, man. Right. Yeah. It's like, hey, dude, I'm, you're not gonna shoot me up with something that you ain't gonna shoot yourself up with. That you know? is true. <laughs> so, but where our problem is, man, is we sit around and listen to this okey doke bullshit on that idiot box that they call the television or your iPhone, you know, and you'll listen to these white folks tell you, hey, you got to take the shot because there's a disease going around and it's going to kill you. And, you know, and then they'll they'll take uh, from what I've been hearing is like they'll they'll get some people that are on death row. And they'll shoot them up with whatever, and they'll be the first subjects because they experiment on all of us, man. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. same thing with uh, with the Jeffrey Epstein, you know. 
and the children. Uh, this, this country is the, is the biggest pedophile country on the planet, man. On the planet. All these pedophiles, and it starts in the government. It starts in the police department. It starts in the feds. All of these people are, are in these occults, and they're pedophiles, dude. So, I mean, you know, you're looking at a crisis that's, that's heavy. That's, I mean, it's insane, man. So um, if we don't come together and protect each other, who's going to protect us? You, you know what I mean? Them. We you ain't got them. no allies, man. <laughs> we have no allies, brother. Yeah. That's right. what I'm telling you. And then all these, uh, all these so-called superstars um, from the from the Denzel Washingtons on down to the the Spike Lees and the, and all the rappers that's supposed to be you know this that and the other, you know they doing bullshit. Yeah. Honestly, they're right. not looking after their people. They're looking after themselves and the right. little small group that they keep around them. But looking after their people as a whole, they don't step forward like uh, Kaepernick did. You know, they don't right. step forward and say, hey, you know, why are we letting the Jew um, be in charge of the basketball team when most of the most of the players are black and we kicking ass? Right. Where? Who, why? How come we're not owning our own teams? How right. come we're not owning our own sports? How come we? And that's why they knocked off. Um, my um uh, uh uh the brother that played ball with they killed in the helicopter. Kobe. Kobe. Yeah, yeah. man, Kobe Kobe was getting ready to go to China, <laughs> brother. And he was gonna start his own NBA team and bring all the players to him. And they weren't having it. You he know, this white boy, this white yeah. boy's cool. He's he's a cruel hey man, he's never changed, dude. The, uh, a zebra don't change the stripes. Demons don't either. So you know true. what I mean? Demons are gonna be demons, man. They're gonna do what they do. So, you know, this is um, this is what we're what we're faced with, man. It's like either, you know, you're gonna stand up for something, or you're gonna die for anything. That's it. The bottom it's line, time, man. It's just time. Like they're they're planning to kill a billion people right now. They want to kill one billion people off the planet, man. Look at look. Common sense is right in your face. Look at what they did to Maui. They used a laser to kill all the. They outrightly murdered those people, man, and and all those children. Yeah, it's just crazy, man. When are the when is the whole planet gonna wake up and say, you know what, we ain't taking this shit from these a handful of of Europeans because that's what they are when they came here and nothing changed with them. You know, that's in office along with. Um, the uh, the uh, Israeli Hamas and the rest of them, who are people afraid to speak out about, you know, this is what we're dealing with, man. This is reality, dude. And and until the people stand up and say, hey, we're not doing this anymore, it ain't happening. You know, even in the military right now, they brought in um, for civil unrest. They got foreign troops in the country, man, training to move on us. You know what I mean? And you have you have soldiers here, our our own military are are discussing the situation, man. They're talking about it. Say, hey man, look, and you can't come on our land and try to and try to control our people on our land. But this is how they got this the Bidens and all of these and the and and I'm sorry to say it, you know, but the Obamas, same shit, man. He didn't do a damn thing for our people, man. Zero. He did his homosexual thing, but he didn't do nothing for our people, man. The Oprah Winfrey's, all these people who claim to be down for, you know, for us, for the for the cause, and they ain't never been down for nothing but themselves and the and the uh, and the occult that they're involved in, you know. So this is this is what we're looking at, man. I mean, you know, we're looking at a we're looking at a serious crisis, brother, and. Um, if our people do not wake up and stop entertaining themselves, you know, you're looking at being an, uh, annihilated, honestly, you know, and um, I can say at 72 years old, man, I can say what I'm saying to you because I've been around the world uh, a gillion times and I've seen many things from many countries. I've learned many things from different people. I've, you know, been around the military and, 
uh, you know, been locked down like every other brother have. And for yeah. those who haven't, who, those right. who, those who've escaped, you know, that's good for them, man. So you know, yeah. I can say, I can say, hey, this is what it's like. You know what I mean? But right. um, hey, man, this is what they do, man. It, it, you know, they just and they don't care, dude. At, right now, they're at a point to where, okay, well, we're just gonna out blatantly do it. What they're gonna do about it? There ain't yeah. nobody doing nothing. Everybody's laying down and and then they go, they, they, they protest, and that's it. Then they go through the next day and um and they act like everything's all hunky dory and you know, and they go by and sit down and eat when other people are starving to death. You know, they right. sit down, have good meals, go home and relax, watch some TV, go to the movies and go yeah. out to dinner and, and play like life is is so is so wonderful for them. Yeah when their fellow man is suffering, you know, um, and, and it's, a, it's a shame, man, you know, and then if, if we don't get our people to come to their senses and say, why are we fighting with each other? We're not each other's enemy. I'm not your enemy, man. We ain't enemies to each other. I don't care what kind of differences we have. That's differences. That's some bullshit. That's the ego, you know, ego, we go, you know, if we don't put all that shit aside and come together and say, you know what? Hey man, you hungry? Here, let's eat together. You need right. someone? You need to pay your rent? In here, pay me whenever. Right. Don't, don't even think about. I don't even want it. I'm not even having it in my head. If I ever get it back, it doesn't matter. But we need right. to keep that that role going like that. You know, if yeah. we if we need uh if we need assistance, hey man, you know we need some help over here, man. We need to get these youngsters up out of the dirt and get them straight. We need to start our own programs back. Look, look what they've done, man. Nobody, brother, I get so frustrated sometimes, man. Nobody studies music anymore. Ooh. Everything is done with this computer. They think that, that, you know, most of the rappers think, oh, yeah, I'm a producer. And I'm, and they walk around with their chest out like they created the music industry. And you did not. It's a bunch of bullshit. If right. I, You couldn't read music if I wrote it out. You right. wouldn't know an A flat if I hit you with one. Right. You know? <laughs> So how are you going to say you produce? Produce what? You're reinventing something in a box that can break down at any time. Music comes from the soul and the mind. You know what I mean? It's rhythmic. It comes out of the out of the spirit. And yeah. If you don't have it, you don't have it, man. You know what I mean? You can't create it out of a computer. So yeah. that's the problem, man. And then, and it's getting I, worse. I, AI. I mean, come on. Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? And that's and this is the thing that uh, that the actors are dealing with right now, complaining about AI. They they yeah. got the they let these white folks come up and slip the stuff up on them, and they started out with um, if you ever you got to go back and watch movies. I tell people that when you go when you watch television and you watch movies, don't don't do it as entertainment. Take right. a pencil and paper and write what you see. So true. Yeah, that's true. Look at I Robot with Will Smith. Mm -hmm. Look at the Gemini Man with Will Smith. All of those things are telling you this is what they plan on doing. And right. they're doing it. As you sleep or you out partying and sitting on, standing on the corner, smoking whatever. I don't know what that stuff is they smoke, man. It ain't weed because I grew up during the 60s and the 70s, man, when I went to Woodstock, Jack. And now uh, I know what weed smell like. That right. stuff that they put in they in their system is a chemical, man. Most of it is uh is um is is soaked in factories in formaldehyde. And for those who don't know what formaldehyde is, that's embalming fluid. That's what they yeah. use to to shoot you up with when you're dead to make your body stiff so that you don't stink. You know what I mean? Right. And so um they put that as well as all the other chemicals. And it's so they're soaking. finding out, huh? It's soaking in there. Yeah, man. And so they're finding out that this stuff is having an effect on people's brain. You know, it's causing them to have mental problems. It's not helping them at all. And it slows you down. Like when you're in jail, they try to stick saltpeter in your food, you know, to keep right, right, you from right. having sexual feelings and also to slow down your 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 chain of thought. And if you ever go into a government facility or go to jail, look at the walls. And you go in a courtroom, same thing. Everything is gray or either light gray or dark gray. That 
that t- that tends to tone down your thought pattern. And yeah. so they have an up over you. And that's what's happening in the society. Even if you look outside at, uh, you know, during the day now, things are not as sunny as they used to be because they keep dropping this stuff from the chemtrails over the, the clouds and causing the, the, um, the, the, dens- the density of, <laughs> uh, of the sunlight. You know what I mean? Right. And so um, that's another aspect of what we're dealing with. So as long as they can keep you dumbed down, and then they they put this this chemical food in your system. They give oh. me now. They're giving you meat that they create in a lab. You oh. know what I mean? The fish is contaminated. So man. I tell people, man, you better go back to the beginning. And that's the vegetables and fruit, man. All you gotta do is wash that off real good, soak it and clean it off, and then you you eat properly or grow your own. You yeah. Know? Yes. But depending on depending on this white boy. To give you some to take care of you. When has he ever cared anything about your health? None. You know what I mean. So, and again, I'm you got to go back. You got to go back to the Tuskegee experiment, man. Yeah. You know, all the people that they shot up with the syphilis, and it's insane, man. How hate is that bad? You yeah. know. It's and sad. then the um, what's her name, Margaret Thatcher, um, who started the. Uh, the um this thing where they got the women going in and getting the abortions and stuff like this and uh, taking the birth the birth control pills, you know, to stopping your birth growth. Then they telling the women, oh, don't have babies, you know, you know, for what? You're 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 an independent woman. Really? How is a woman independent when you gotta depend on this white boy anyway? That's right. You know what I mean? He gonna tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. But you come home to your man and it's like it's hell, all hell breaks loose. Because yeah. they got your brain, they got your brain fucked. They got you your know? programmed. <laughs> come on, man. Yeah, man. And it's getting ready to get worse. Really, it's getting ready to get bad, man. Um, with this, with this AI stuff, they they created the robots already that are military style robots. And, man, it's getting oh. Yeah, brother. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. If we didn't, have, if we ended up having a civil war in this country, yeah, because we do for we do for something extreme, and uh, when you go to sleep at night, thinking that you trust someone to to run your life for you, how do you know what these people are doing behind closed doors, and in their secret societies and down in their temples and all these different places of this nature you know what i mean <clears throat> how do you know what they're planning <clears throat> for you and your demise they right. already sat down they sit in the pentagon they sit back and think, okay this is this is what we're doing in the next five years you know we're going to build this and we're going to take over this city over here and we're going to uh you know wipe out these people and we're going to start a war because there's money in war and yeah. you know one thing leads to another man Let's we're going to we're going to kidnap children and uh, kill them and, and take their blood and drink it so we can stay so we can stay young and healthy. This is the bullshit they believe, you know. Crazy, man. Dude, you know, uh, it's a it's a strain, man. You when you walk out the door. You don't know what to expect. Sometimes I look up in the sky at night, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, man. And um, in the a.m. Let me correct myself in the AM. And um, there is, I, I, I try to see what's going to come next. <clears throat> and of course, they're going to bullshit you with this alien thing. That's the next thing they're coming up with. They're trying to figure out how they're going to trick your mind now, you know, <laughs> to, to to believe this. And, you know, the trickometry that they use, man, and with the satellites and all this other kind of stuff they got going on, man. And they're the only ones that I was listening to a brother today on Instagram and he was talking about what all white people control. They control the ju- the judges, they control the cr- the criminal um the uh criminal element, they control all of the uh law, the law enforcement, they control everything in uh in the uh, in the food administration. I mean, they control everything. Yeah. We don't have control over shit. You ain't even control your own self. No. Oh. You know what I mean? So uh-huh. it's just, and I look at, I look, man, I look at our people out there doing all this. We definitely, 
Look, huh? we definitely don't have control over jealousy over each other. Come on, man. You know, come on now. Talk, talk to me. Yeah, brother. <laughs> and then look at the look at the smash and grab. Uh yeah, these fools smashing and grabbing and going in there and the and the idiot things. We're gonna go steal a bunch of purses. And we're gonna steal some clothes. I saw that, yeah. And then what you gonna do with it? You're gonna go on the block and sell it to who? And then eventually they're gonna catch up with your ass because ain't too many people in the hood walking around with Gucci purses <laughs> that are real and shit like this, you know. So now you got these department stores things, and then you got all this jewelry you didn't stole. So where are you gonna fence it at? You know what I mean? Till some eventually somebody's gonna turn on you. Right. You know, some pawn shop or some place like this gonna turn on you, you know, and you can't sell it for what it's worth. Uh, unless you're selling it to to some of the dope dealers, you know, uh, some of the so-called rappers or whatever, and then somebody's going to end up getting robbed and shot and killed, and then it's going to bring the whole thing down on. And they don't think, man. You yeah. know what I mean? The white boy sits back, and he, when he commits crimes, he thinks about how he's going to get away with that crime. Look at the look at everything he's done. He thought about how he was going to take over the country. Yeah. I'm gonna come in and take the land. This is what this is what kills me. They going after little bullshit. If you're gonna do some major shit, like you're gonna go and take back, take something, take the land. Get these 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 people that are coming in here right. or that have came in and, and and built all these beautiful homes and these skyscraper built. Go run up in them buildings and take over. And say, hey, motherfucker, this is my building. Get out. All right, everybody, pay me rent. That's right. You know what I mean? If you're gonna do something. If you ain't gonna do nothing, sit your ass down and shut up. You know what I mean? Because you're just running off and you're just doing stupid shit. And then they being pushed by the, most of the dudes and most men that are in the penitentiary. When I went to jail, I had conversations with a lot of brothers, man. Most dudes in jail because of their female. Yeah. Trying to impress their broad, trying to get some ass, you know, so they want to get some bling and they're doing this, so they're slinging dope and they're doing all this other kind of dumb shit. Yeah, for a woman. For a woman, come on. Yeah. Look, man, let me tell you something, bro. I love women. I love them. I think that they're they have their place in in this life. Right. But before I go to jail for a female man, I'll jack my dick. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, man. It's like, hey, dude, you ain't all that, babe. Yeah. Trust me. And I, I tell my sons the same thing, man. It's like, dude, no, we don't go down that road, man. Um. So you know. The men have to lead, and they got to lead right, man, because we don't have leaders anymore. Most of all our leaders were assassinated. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? All of them, man, were were knocked off, and it, and they were knocked off because we helped knock them off. The jealousy, the envy, we helped knock. We have we we assisted this white this white boy into doing everything that he's done to us. Man. Uh, we were hired hitmen, huh? Absolutely. You know what I mean? So. It's it's sad, dude, um, that you could be manipulated like that. Yeah, it really is. You know what I mean. So it, until until we um, until we come together as a united front, you're looking at major problems in the future, man. Because everybody's thinking about every man for himself and God for him too, and that's not the way that life, real life, turns out to be, man. Because you need somebody, and you're going to have to depend on somebody. You're going to have to depend on somebody you trust. And and I and I want to say this too, man. For all those Negroes who are in the police department, who are in the FBI and the CIA and all the mother letter people, and uh, in the military, you better get your head out your ass because you're nothing but pawns for the powers that be. They put you're supposed to be there to help your people, but you you show them that you hate your people more than they do. You're you're assisting them in your own people's demise. And then what do you think they're gonna do with you after you've done their job? They're gonna come get you too. It's yeah. the same way that Hitler did with the Jews. It should be like that Carlitos way scene. Yeah, man. Uh, the way that Hitler did, Hitler did the Jews. Hitler, so Hitler, Hitler, Hitler went and got all the educators and all them different people, and they turned, they told, uh, they told on all the other poor people, and then Hitler turned around and knocked them off too. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So, hey, man, they better wake up, dude. You know, it's just, it's, it's sad, bro. It's sad, brother. But um, I, I really wish us well in our endeavors in life, and and hopefully we can make a change and not fall for this bullshit that uh, that this this European is putting out there. Um, he's demonic. You know what I mean? The devil never rests. He never sleeps. You know, um, when you're sleeping and partying and getting high. And I mean, look at our people. Man, I was looking at uh, our people on the streets of Philadelphia mm. where I was born and raised, man. You know, wow. bent over like zombies. Zombies. I saw that. Yeah. Doped out, man. Because they go and get this stuff from this white boy. And or they they let these 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 niggas that need to be knocked off sell them this bullshit on these streets because they're you're selling death to your own people. Come on, man. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> Come on, brother. How are you gonna sell death to your own people and not know and realize that death is gonna come to you? That's right. No one of us, not one. I don't care how much armies you control or whatever. You ain't going to be on this planet forever. You have an expiration date on your life, man. And the, and the one who gave it to you and put you here because you didn't create yourself is coming for it. He's coming for his debt that you owe. That's right. You ass going to that grave. And when you go in there, guaranteed, ain't nothing going in there with you except for your deeds. Whatever you've done in this life. The only thing you can leave. Say again. Whatever you've done in this lifetime. Yeah, man. You know, and and, and whatever and what you leave on this planet. There, there's a as a Muslim, we say there are four things that go to the grave with you. Your wife, your children, your wealth, and your deeds. Mm. Only one goes into that grave and three stay on the top. Your deeds go into that grave with you and everything else stays at on the top. Wife, children, and wealth don't go in that hole with you. That's right. And so what you take into the next world from what you did in this life is what you're going to be accountable for. You know, so we got a, we got a, we got a road, man to travel and you know like i said there's an expiration date on your expansion on this planet how you go out of here or how much time you have on this planet is based on what you do what are you worthy of why are you here and that's, that's right. what this this uh this european is he's trying to play god and say that you don't have a place on this planet because of all the stupid shit that he's indoctrinated into you so now you think like a beast. And so now he wants to get rid of the beast that he created. That he created. That, you, know, you know what I mean? And so we continue to fall into that, into that factor. And the churches and all these other religious organizations, they're not doing shit for the people. They are selling lies because they're making money off of everybody. That's right. And Big Obama made a statement that I'll never forget when he was given a talk once at a summit. And he said that we need to take over because the people don't have control over themselves. They don't know what to do. So we need to take control over them. And that's all that, that new world order shit that, you know. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so because of it, it, the way that it looks, like, you know, you got to be policed because you can't police yourself. You can't tell yourself, hey, it's not right to go rob my neighbor. It's not right to rape that lady over there and take her what belongs to her that she's worked hard for. And it's not, our, it's not right to do that, but that's what they've done. Right. Every, if you look at the history of the white man, everywhere he's gone on the planet, he's brought nothing but death and destruction, famine, war, murder, mayhem, rape, pillaging. That's his history. Yeah. That's not our history uh, up until lately. But that's what he's done on this planet, man. Kidnapping. He's the biggest kidnapper on the planet. Look what he did with us. Man. You know, enslaving, slavery. That's his his history, dude. You know what I mean? So, brother, 
<laughs> and then look at what they're doing in the school system now. Oh, gosh. You know what I mean? In the school system, they're telling you that if your if your child if if your child wants to be a homosexual at three or four years old, and you tell your child no, and the child tells the teacher, "My mommy and daddy said no, I can't do it," they will come and take your kid from you. <laughs> I'm glad that my kids are grown because they you would be reading about me in the newspaper, man. Oh, absolutely. That's some, that's some bullshit. You know what I mean? But again, it's the it's the uneducated situation that we put ourselves in. Let me drop this on you. When your wife, you know, you got kids? Yeah, I got daughters. Okay, you got daughters. Okay. So when your kid, when your wife was in the hospital carrying the baby, it's pregnant. And she goes into the delivery and, you know, you're waiting out there to find out you're anxious. Oh, you know, what's happening? What's happening? If you're fortunate enough to be in there and, and help with the birth, see the baby come through the birth canal. Once the baby's on, you know, here, the doctor takes and smack the baby on the ass. Baby cried. They stick the, the little pump down there and pull out or whatever stuff that's in the baby's mouth. Right. right? And the lungs. <laughs> and then the nurse takes the baby. Right. So then the nurse, nurse takes the baby to clean the baby off. They take the cut the umbilical cord, which you should ask for. No one should have that. That's DNA. That belongs to you. So you should have that. You should be able to have it and bury it or whatever you're going to do with it. Because they'll take it and make purses and all kinds of shit they do with it. They re recreate you with that, with that DNA. Right. Then while they're cleaning the baby, the nurse goes immediately to the mother when she's weak. Right. And what does she say to the mom? You know the first thing she says? She well, goes with a pad. She goes with a pad and a pencil. You know what she tells her? What's that? Sign the birth certificate. <laughs> so when you sign that piece of paper, you know what you just did? You just signed the right of your child over to the state. So that kid is not yours anymore. That's why they can go around and, co and commit murder. Police can kill your child and walk away and get away with it. That's right. They can send they can send child services to come and take your child from you at any given time. Yeah. It ain't your baby. <clears throat> so until you control the birthright, you have no control at all. You just, you know, you're just a, a custodian for the white man. And we don't do this. We don't study. They study. We don't. They have a different educational factor going on. They take they took black history out of the schools and they put trans transgender in. What kind of shit is that, man? Bam. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we sit around and take that and, and say, oh yeah, it's all good. Because most of our people now fall suit to that homosexual bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I call it bullshit. I don't care. I have nothing to lose. I mean, I don't give a shit if the gays rise up. They can rise to the top of the mountain against me. I could care less, man, because I don't ask them for shit. You know what I mean? Reality is reality. A man is a man. You got a dick. You ain't going to have no babies. You know, unless it come out your ass, like Eddie said, and we can call you Mr. Shitty. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But you ain't having no babies, dude. And the women ain't going to grow no dick. You know what I mean? They go put a plastic one on, but that's it. You know what <laughs> I mean? Go get a vibrator and, you know, till the battery run out or, or, or mildew, you know, but that's it, man. You know, you are what you are. You're a woman. You ain't a man, period. Period. I don't care how much sports you get involved in. You can box all day. You can run track. You can jump over a mountain. But you are what God made you. When you die, you're going into that grave the same way. What's on your birth certificate don't say uh, when you're a man that says you're a female. Or when you're a female that says you're a man. You come in here with a pussy and a dick. That's it. Yeah. And that's what you're going out with. Unless you're one of them kind, you go to the plastic surgeon and give him all your money to cut you up. 
So now you go to the Jew again and let him cut your body up and cut your dick off and <laughs> flip it backwards or whatever, you know, <laughs> and say, hey, you know, this is, this is, you're a woman now. Oh, okay, whatever. Or they shoot you up in the chest, open you up, crack you open and put something up in there and make you look like you got titties, you know. The silicone in you. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, brother. I mean, you know, man, this is the, how can you, that, that's a, that is a distorted mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even operations, dude. I, operations only if they're necessary. It's like people are dying of cancer, right? Because they do the wrong things to stay healthy. They don't eat properly. They smoke. They drink. So you got prostate cancer. You got colon cancer. You got breast cancer. You got all these all the different cancers going around that they have cures for. Mm-hmm. But they ain't going to give it to you. Because look how long the cancer society has been around. Look how much money they make off of your death and your stupidity. You know what I mean? They don't give a shit, man. I'm trying, I, you know, I'll I be trying to tell these people, look, I lost my mother and father behind the same thing. I used to tell them all the time, mom, dad, what are you doing? My dad used to tell me, hey, who raised you? Okay. Yeah. I can't, I can't argue with that. Right. But you know, that old saying that my grandmother used to say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right. You know what I mean? Or that same, I've heard it plenty of times. Come on, brother. It's you know, I mean, it is what it is, man. You want to be on this planet? You better do what you're supposed to do to stay on this planet, man. Stay out of the way of foolishness. You know what I mean? Eat healthy. Have a, have a clean and straight mind. You gotta eat healthy. Have a clean and straight mind. Yes. You know what I mean, dude? Come on, man. It's like. When 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 do you stop the bullshit? When do you wake up and realize that, you know, hey, what am I doing to myself? Or, you know, I was telling a lot of dudes when I was locked up, I said, wait a minute. Well, I had a cause. I went to I went to a jail for a cause. It's like you're not gonna put your hands on me and think you're gonna do whatever you want to do to me. We ain't going <laughs> down like that. But outside of that, I don't rob, steal going murder people and, you know, committing all kinds of mayhem, rape and all that stuff. You know, for what? Why would right. I throw my life away? All the all the bangers that's in jail, man, for murder and, and killing their own, killing you, killing yourself. You look at another person, you're looking right at yourself. But, you know, I mean, this is what we do. And then we, they think it's a badge of honor. They go in the joint and then they find out years later. It ain't that way. Are uh, they? I'm. Uh, I'm on YouTube and I'm looking at some of the um, the convictions when they get the when they get the death penalty thrown down to them, or the right. fact they're gonna be in prison, and then they break down crying, falling out. Oh, yeah. you didn't think about that shit before you were doing all this bullshit out here. Right. Come on now. <laughs> you know what I mean. So this is we're not educating each other, man. No, you know, we're not. We're, not, we're not spending time talking to one another. And, and the older brothers, like, you know, when I was growing up, man, we used to get the education at the barbershop. Oh, you know, God. The brothers wasn't in there talking foolishness, except for the pimps would come in every now and then talking yeah. about how many hoes they have, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, the older brothers in there, man, like the Muslims and, you know, some of the brothers that was with Malcolm, they come in the, come in the barbershop, man, they're getting a haircut, and they talking about what's going on, man. The Black Panthers, the Mau Mau's, you know, they were, they were, hey, man, look, this is what we got to do to the community. This is, hey, little brother, come over here, you know. Sit down. What are you, what you doing with that over there, brother? Take that out your hand. Take that out your mouth. Put that down, little brother, you know. They be on your ass, man. They be. Um, I remember um, yeah, with the nation, man, the FOI, Back in the day when uh, you see cats on the street gambling in front of uh, people's houses and stuff, you know, and the brothers would come and say, hey, man, um, we're going to go around the corner. When we come back, be gone. Hey, you still there? Um, you got a problem. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you got a problem, man. Now the bull ass my and say, hey, you know, serve them. <laughs> serve them the soup that they supposed to drink because it ain't. That ain't cool, man. You know, we did the same thing with the pimps. 
Right. You ain't, put, you ain't putting up women out here on no whole stroke, dude. Are you crazy? That ain't happening. Yeah, man. So things are just, I don't know, man. It's a different, they say it's a different day and time, but I don't. I say it's the same time. It's just different things happening. Yeah, it is you know the same. I mean? and, uh, and we're not the ones controlling the time. They the white boys doing it. They even tell you what time it is. They give you a watch. You know, this is what time you have to wake up, go to sleep, come to work. You know, that's why I don't work for nobody. I ain't never work for nobody, man. You know, I show up when I want to show up. You can't tell me you're fired. You know, no, you don't have that privilege to. Best feeling in the world. You know, come on, man. You know what I mean? I ain't going to let you do that to me, you know. You're not gonna tell me I can't ride the bus. Yeah. You know, right. When I was uh 12 years old, man, I saw my first lynching. Mm. I was 12 years old, and I was with one of my friends. His name was Calvin Lewis, and we were we used to go in the woods all the time in, in Florida. I was in the Boy Scouts, and wow, we'd, we'd go in the woods, man, catch snakes and you know boy stuff, man, all that kind of stuff, fishing and that kind of thing, man. And we going through the woods, and we're hearing all this commotion going on. So we're hiding down in the bushes and there was um, these white boys that had this truck. They had hoods on. One dude didn't have a hood on. I saw his face. And um, there was a truck, they had a pickup truck, and they had this brother on the feet on the truck. And he was a strip. He was butt naked. The only thing he had on was his boots. Wow. And um, they had a noose around his neck and they cut his, cut his dick off. And he bled out in his boots and they pulled the truck off. And you can hear his neck snap. At 12, I see this at 12 years old, man. You know. So I I look at this whole thing, brother, and like these cats don't know what it's like, man. This 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 generation, they have no idea. Yeah. I speak seven languages, man. Seven. I dropped out of school in the seventh grade. You know what I mean? Nobody taught me about life except for my brothers uh, to a certain degree. Well, you know, I was I really educated myself traveling around and, you know, going to different countries and, you know, learning different things like this, man. And, um, you know, my brothers, my brothers, they kept me out of trouble, you know, because they would kick my ass if I did anything <laughs> outside of that, you know, before my dad got to me, you know, they beat me up, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but you know, man, um, I came out of those families, you know, back in, you know, back in the day too, man, your neighbors used to whip your ass. Oh, you know it. You know what I mean? And then you when your mom you found out, you get another one. Come on, man. Look, <laughs> my, my mom, boy, you know, she used to tear my sister's asses up with an extension cord. You go oh, and have God. all the wealth all over your body. They call yeah. that child, child abuse now, man. It was shit. It, but it was, look at how they grow up. You know, look at the generation, the difference. Huh? I've had my fair share, man. <laughs> yeah, man. You get whipped with a coat hanger. I, I seen my mother beat my older sister's ass with a with a tennis racket. <laughs> she said, oh, you going to talk back to me? Okay. And my mom was a little short lady, man. And um, one of my brothers, you know, had said something smart. And she took the little stool that she uh, goes up in the cabinet and gets... Um, get stuff out the cabinet to cook with. She calls, she says, come here. She took the stool and put it in front of him and stood up on it and slapped the shit out of him. She said, you know, I don't care how old you get. You don't That's ever right. talk back to me. Ooh. You know what I mean? It's like we came up like that, man. Yeah. And then my grandmother, she used to carry a derringer. So <laughs> <laughs> she, she, tried, she shot her brother in the ass. So... <laughs> So she'll shoot you. My, my grandmother didn't play, man. She sat on that porch. She had a derringer and a shotgun. She had a double barrel shotgun. And when the white boys would come around talking crazy, she said, I'll blow your ass away. <laughs> Get off my property, you know. But yeah, man, I, I, I came up with real people, man. You know, real situations. And, and then when I went overseas, you know, my time I spent off and on, I spent off and on 18 years in Japan, between Japan and Okinawa, and um, I learned etiquette, courtesy, and you know, just different different ways of how to 
treat there's, people how to yeah. act. There's so much, so much of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. Discipline, discipline, brother. You know, and um, I carry that through, you know, through my life. Um, I, my children the same. All my kids are saying they know I don't play either, too. You know, I'm like my dad, man. Okay. And I tell them, I talk to them the same way. I look, I put my foot in your ass, dude. <laughs> oh, you know. So, hold on, man. This battery is burning out of me. One second. <laughs> yeah, brother. So, you know, um, I just, uh, Yeah, man. I um, I try to stay up on. There we go. We back in the back in the box. Yeah, I try to stay up on um, on everything, man. And you know, just try to do my best, bro. I try to do my best. You know, anybody that your people that are listening to this, they want to um, to connect with me. Um, I'm on Instagram, the Jerry Bell official. Or either um, they can go to my web. I have two websites up. One is uh, jerrybellmusic.com. Or they can go to J as in James, V as in Victor, B as in boy, oasis.com. Like, oh, the, like, like uh, the desert oasis. Yeah. And, JVB and oasis. Huh? Let's talk about the, the exciting event you got coming up, too. Tell us about yeah, man. So I have a concert coming up. Uh, this will be the first one uh, of the year that I'm doing, um, which is actually a tune-up concert um, at the Catalina Jazz Club in Hollywood. So for those who are living in Los Angeles or wherever you may be and you want to fly in and see the show or you come to the show, it's a, it's a dinner and concert. And um, November the 30th, I'll be there. Be there, be square, brother. Be there. <laughs> but yeah, that'll be the first show. I have a 15-piece band and a seven-piece string ensemble. And my band is like crazy, man. My my band members come from different bands, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, Chicago, um, uh, Gap Band. Some, I got some of the Gap Band members that used to play with Gap, play, play with me now. Um, one guy that was with Zap. With Roger Trotman, he's with me. Uh, um, wow. Uh, I'm, my my background females. Um, they've sang with Aretha and Whitney. You know, I have two background vocalists, and um, I have a pretty pretty tight, real tight. I'm my excited. musical director. I did. Say again. I meant to tell you, uh, Rhea Roma said hello. Who? Oh yeah, Rhea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell her, tell her, give her my love, man. It's a beautiful, beautiful person, man. Beautiful human being, dude. Got a good spirit. Yeah, that's Absolutely. who put us together. Shout yeah. out, to yeah, yeah, man. So yeah, bro. Um, the show's gonna be um, be off the chain. I'm doing all the hits, you know, from Dad's band, the New Birth, and then uh, my new stuff, and then some other things I do. You know, my my music um, um, and my shows are similar to it's like a cross between Marvin Luther Teddy Pendergrass oh man you know that kind of a that's a great that company kind of yeah man and we give you you know we give you the funk bro you know we put some James Brown in there too you know I can't <laughs> let you forget the Godfather you know <laughs> yeah I, man, so. I tell you man Jerry I, I want to just let you know man I appreciate all the knowledge, all the things that you just you dropped for the viewers that are watching and, and just the man that you've become, you know, and I, I just want to let you know, man, how much I appreciate you and how much we appreciate you on the show. Thank you, brother. Thank you much, man. I I I, I got your uh, your text that you sent to Eddie. So yeah. um hopefully he'll respond. And you get him on the show. He he gets on the hill. I got a lot of knowledge from that brother, man. You know, we traded we traded secrets. You know, <laughs> secrets. <laughs> yeah, man. He uh, he's a knowledgeable brother. And um, if you listen to his comedy, um, it's reality. You know, um, so 
Well, we got a lot of people out there like that, man. Some of us speak out. Some of us don't. Some of us are afraid. Look, right. man, you you can only die one time. That's right. You know what I mean? You, you can kill me once. So I'm not going to die a coward. That's right. You know what I mean? And then you bring the you bring the fight, and you know, you might go with me. You know right. What I'm right. <laughs> but I'm gonna go out standing on my square, dude. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah, brother. So, yeah, man. Um, just you know, anytime, man. I'm 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 glad to come on the show and talk about whatever, and you know, have these discussions. We need to have discussions, really. You know, we definitely do. Well, thank you so much, my brother, and you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I will. And one other thing before I go to another brother, you should get on your show is you should talk to uh, Professor Griff. Oh, man. I, I love some Professor Griff. Yeah, man. You should you should get up at Professor Griff, man, and um, get Professor Griff on the show. Absolutely, man. I definitely yeah. I got to get the S1Ws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah brother Professor Griffiths is down man that's my cat I love him man alright All brother right. thank you so much man you uh, you enjoy the rest of your time and ladies and gentlemen thank you for listening in and I appreciate everybody love you all uh, including our enemy <laughs> <laughs>
if you are all over the place and you haven't found your lane, then you really don't know who to target. And you kind of like all over the place, you know, so finding out what, what people like and leaning into it, the things that they like about you, you have to lean into it. And, you know, those people will eventually gravitate towards you and enable you to build a fan base. So it's very important to me. Yeah, that's extremely important. And I also know what's important to you is when you think about your music, um, you're you're the type of artist that likes to talk about what's really going on in the world, from pain, the struggle, um, overcoming obstacles, things that people can really relate to, which we need more of these days. What is there anything inside of you that that, that made you want to go that direction? Because I'm sure you could have went so many other directions. Just being authentic and being relatable to people. Uh, I feel that that's the best way to get genuine people to support you. You know, uh, people can tell when you're not genuine. Uh, I'm a filmmaker as well. And I tell the actors that are in my films, you know, a lot of the times people on, in, in the audience going to be able to tell if you're faking it. I need you to be that character. I need you right. to be that person. I need you to be authentic. And right. Ready. That's true. Absolutely. And so you worked with a lot of people, but before we get into that, what was your first, what was your first discovery where you felt like, okay, I want to take this music thing professionally. Well, my first discovery was when, you know, basically back in high school, you know, freestyling at the lunch table. Uh, it's a typical story, freestyling at the lunch table, freestyling in the back of the bus, you know what I'm saying? In the classroom, my homie, he banging on the table, making a beat. You know, I loved, I loved it. You know what I'm saying? So that always that had always stuck with me, you know, as I was getting older. And I always knew I was going to come back to music. I always knew I was going to do music. You know, I always knew I was going to be a creator. It, it, it's something in me about the music. It just, it elevates my frequency, man. And it allows me to have therapy when I make music. It allows me to you know, clear my mind. It's my form of meditation and it's peaceful to me. Yeah. And and you know what? I mean, that's the beauty of it too, because it is peace. It's peaceful. It's, it's therapy. You know, the name of the show is called mental margarita. So, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to bring out the best in people. We're trying to uplift people. And mental margarita is all about, you know, what is your therapy? What is your escape from the world? So music was your escape. And as you progressed on in your career, let's talk about revenge season. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Revenge season was one of my projects in 21, 2021 that I, I released. Uh, I had legendary artists on that project, Raz Cast. I have Corrupt on that album, King Crooked on that album. Uh, yeah. It was my foot, foot, and I also had that album distributed by Sony uh, Orchard. So it was my, it was my testimony and my respect that I had to pay to the artists that came before me that inspired me, you know, and I was so lucky and fortunate to be able to do songs with artists like that and, you know, I looked at it like that was my coming out season. It wasn't right. about revenge physically. It was about proving to myself that I could be successful, that I could be on, on par with a guy like Raz Cass, that I could be on a track with a guy like King Crooked. I wanted to show the world that I had talent too. And, you know, it was my respect and homage that I wanted to pay to the hip hop world. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? You, you did a fine job. And speaking of Razzcast, I mean, the list goes on, guys. From Corrupt, from the Dog Pound, from the Game, to Yo Gotti. I mean, how did how do all these connections come about? Well, a lot of those connections come about from really, you know, networking, you know, and spending money in order to, you know, really get those futures. I had to pay for those futures. And a lot of those artists, you know, I talked to, but I haven't met because, you know, I bought the future. They sent it on over the internet. You know, they sent it online through the email. Uh, and it's, it, I get the contract and I do the song. 
you know, and yeah. whatever the contract says, they get their percentage of the royalties. And, you know, that's just what it is. And, you know, I'm fortunate to be able to get those type of futures. And, you know, it made me feel more confident in myself knowing that I could get on tracks with guys like that. It's, it's been on for a while and it's been doing their thing in the industry and I've made so many waves. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the most important part is that, you know, from an independent standpoint, you're not scared to put up your money and say, hey, this is where I want to go. And so I'm willing to invest in myself. How important is being an entrepreneur and taking an independent approach, owning your own? How important is that to you? Oh, it's very important. It's very important. And um, a lot of the times, you know, people are scared to take risks. And me, I was the same way. And you'll realize after a while, you're going to take some losses. It's inevitable. And you're going to get to the point, if you keep pushing and keep going, that it won't even bother you. You know what I'm saying? It won't even bother you because you already know, like, shit, this will come along with it. So right. you're going to be all out. And just be ready for whatever at any time, because if that's something you're really passionate about, you're going to have to take your lumps. You know, you're going to have right. to get they're going to go through things that you're not going to like, but that's part of the growth process. Yeah, it's definitely part of the growing process. Now, when you look at uh, Columbus, South Carolina, where you're at right now, correct? Yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia, Mid South Carolina. There we go. Now, when you look at that area there, uh, how is how is the music scene there, and are you thriving in that area? It's coming, man. It's it's coming along. There's so many talented artists in in Columbia, South Carolina, man, and in so many talented artists in the Carolinas. Period. North Carolina and South Carolina, and man, so it's 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 thriving honestly. Because from what I see, since I've moved out here. I've met so many talented individuals that can act, rap, sing, model. And, you know, it's like Atlanta to me. <laughs> I love yeah, I'll tell you, it's like the ATL, baby. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I used to, I used to live out in Atlanta. Now, you got a single and it's called Unfair. And, and I heard this single and I, I feel that it is unfair. What you're doing to the competition out there. <laughs> featuring Terrell tell me a little bit about that oh well that song man uh, Terrell was actually the first major artist that gave me a feature um, I'm forever grateful for him for doing that uh, I actually talked to him today and uh, you know he's a good guy man uh, solid brother uh, that song came about when I was going through a lot of my you know personal life with my kids and things like that so that's where the motivation for that song came from because he was going through things as well so we collabed we made a song you know that was our first feature together and it's more to come so you know that was our first experience working with each other and i think you know the next track we get with each other gonna be even doper like that that one was i mixed and mastered that track myself so next time it's gonna be even even doper because we're gonna have a video come with it and everything oh man and let me and let me say that again. It's it's un, the single is unfair featuring T Rail. And yes. uh, I tell you one thing, that track is hot, man. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate that. That track is jamming, and we're gonna we're gonna play it on the Mental Margarita Show. Awesome, awesome. Man, now awesome. what? It, now what are you what are you working on? Okay, so I know about the single. What's next? What's next for Sova? Come on. Oh, I got some futures in the tuck, man. I got some futures in the chamber I haven't released yet. I got a future with Jada Kiss coming. I got a future with Cameron. What? I got a future with uh just a couple people, man. I got a feature with Sean Kingston coming. Uh it's some so much stuff. And I'm working on a, a project now called 50 Pack. It's a series similar to, you know, like Power or Empire, but it's all independent artists. Uh, up and coming actors and actresses from Columbia and, and some parts of North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, a few from Atlanta. Like, so I'm, I, I film make, so I'm putting together a series, you know, they can showcase other people's talent, get their music in the, in the movies, in the series and everything. And then I'm going to distribute it to to be Amazon Prime, all those networks. And we are, we're going to build together, you know, that's, that's, that's what's in the chamber, man. 
Yeah. You got him in the chamber, man. You like Wu Tang, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, I got a song with Capadonna too. From Wu hey, big shout out to Cap. Yeah, it's called Queen. Y'all can check that out on all major platforms. It's already out. Oh, yes, man. I'm so proud of you, man. I love the way that you're moving right now. Thank you now, so much, man. Are you going to be doing the tour or, or, or you're performing anywhere? Pretty soon, yeah. I'm going to be performing in Charlotte, North Carolina on January the 11th. Uh, that's my next performance that I will be doing. Um, it's the it's my conference uh, showcase. Uh, Benny Poe. Uh, the founder of, you know, uh, Equity, uh, which is up under Rock Nation, it's a subsidiary of, of Rock Nation, which I have my publishing and distribution deal through. He's hosting this event in Charlotte, North Carolina, so that'll be the next time I perform. Wow, that's nice. Yes, sir. That, yes, that's sir. fantastic. So you're, you're really connecting and you're plugging in and your name is just steady growing. I'm seeing the buzz happening. You're doing the filmmaking now. Do you have the same amount of passion for the filmmaking as you do creating the actual music? Oh yeah, I love to film make man. Um, it, it's it's kind of it kind of goes back to when I said you know when I was a kid, I used to like to draw and make artwork. To me, the filmmaking is adding on to the music, and vice versa. You know, the music is adding on to the filmmaking because you you know you need music for film, so it's like goes hand in hand with you know, me being a creator, because I actually edit everything and put it together. Uh, you know, I do all the, you know, filming, actual camera work, everything, you know, and I do get people to hold a camera for me sometimes. So I appreciate those people that do that for me, y'all, you know. Wow, that's great, man. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Silva Black to Dawn in the house representing Southern Virginia. And let me tell you something. This guy here has got it going on. Now, Soba, how do they get in contact with you if they want booking or inquiries or any of, you know, that kind of stuff? Well, you can, you can hit me on my email, soberblackmusic at gmail.com. Or you can just message me on Facebook. My artist page is Sober Black. Uh, my IG is uh, at official Sober Black. And my Twitter is at God Sober. Big G. Big S. So you can follow me on all those platforms and also tune in to me on Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, iTunes, Pandora, iHeartRadio, all YouTube, all those networks. You can just tap in and follow me, you know what I'm saying? So YouTube, uh, that's The Sober Show. If you type in The Sober Show, all my content will pop up. Um, you can follow me on that. Subscribe to the channel, like, comment, etc. And, you know, we're going to keep rocking. And I appreciate everybody that do tune in and tap in and show me support, man. For real. Absolutely. The city of Las Vegas is going to love Silver the Don. Hey, look, you made this show the Silver Show, man. We might have to change the name. Hey. <laughs> hey, man, I like that. I like that. <laughs> and we definitely got to collaborate, man. I want to thank you so much for being on the Mental Margarita Show, Silver. And God thank bless you and yours, my brother. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys. And thank you for putting my, my content up. I really appreciate it so much. Shout out to Vegas. I'm in Vegas, mama. <laughs> hey, take the world, my brother. Yes, sir. Champagne glass and your cigars up. See the guys with mob ties drive the cars up. Bright lights, most nights they buy the bars up. Candy coated Chevy cars on the highway. It's Frankie Baby, it's on, and this is my way. Dean Martin at the Sands this Friday. With Sammy Davis, here's a little hint where I stay.
the city shines like Liberace's mansion. And you know Elvis had the whole city dancing. Showgirl silhouette steady prancing. Shout out to June, just the Copa Girls anthem. Legal gambling, yeah, that would tempt me. It's Sin City, holy water couldn't cleanse me. And Wayne Newton had the crowd in a frenzy. Live at the Stardust, the seats never empty. 